You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 129. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now, your host, violinist, teacher, and high performance coach for musicians, Dr. Rene Paul Gautier. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing incredibly well as you tune into this conversation. If you're hearing this in May, enrollment for the Music Mastery Experience is open, and there might still be some spots available. So if you find yourself in the transition time with big dreams, but some uncertainty as to how to move forward, maybe you want to win an audition, you want to perform optimally time after time, you want to grow your career or make more money or experience confidence and certainty like never before? Well, all of this is 100% possible and the Music Mastery Experience will get you there. The Music Mastery Experience is the coaching program for musicians. It's a highly personalized group coaching program where I take you through a massive transformation. You're going to feel certainty in the practice room. You're going to experience joy and freedom in performance, gain the confidence you've always wanted, and you will know how to go about creating the career you dream of. If you're ready to crack the code, to start performing at your best and to experience fulfillment in your music career, this program was made for you. We cover everything from practice methods that work to performance preparation strategies that have you perform with confidence consistently and powerful life coaching and mind management techniques that will remove the obstacles and self-limiting beliefs that hold you back. If you're done with not seeing results for the endless amount of work, of time, and energy that you put in the practice room, go to mindoverfinger.com right now and book your free conversation with me. Let's change that today. No more indecision, no more band-aids, no more short-term solutions. The Music Mastery Experience is unlike any other program out there because we go beyond the strategies and methods. We get to the root cause of issues, we unlock everything that's keeping you stuck, and we equip you with all the tools you need to start experiencing amazing results. Not only on stage, but at every level of your music-making experience and your life. You're going to see results from our very first session, and you're not going to believe what you're capable of accomplishing within a short amount of time. But the Music Mastery experience is radical because once you're in, you're in for life. You heard that right. Once you join, you're going to have constant support month after month to keep reaching new heights and realizing new, bigger, and bolder dreams for as long as I run the program. All of this is done in a small, inclusive, and private environment where you're going to feel safe, supported, inspired, and motivated. But the spots are filling up, so don't hesitate. Don't wait. It's time for you to say yes to yourself and to give yourself all the tools you need to create the musical life you've always wanted. It's time to give yourself every advantage. It's not a luxury. Choosing the Music Mastery experience can make a significant change in your overall earning potential. Your competition has a coach. I think you should too. It's not just about the number of hours you're able to do in the practice room. It's about making sure you have a strategic advantage in the practice room, in the audition room, and on the stage. Can you feel how ready you are? I think you are. I think you're ready for new thinking, new tools, and a community of peers creating big things. So book your free call now at mindoverfinger.com and let's make this happen for you. And talking about making things happen, 
Today, you're in for an amazing chat with someone who does just that, and you're going to get the permission slip you've been waiting for to go after what you really want. In this episode, I talk with the incredible mezzo-soprano coach and entrepreneur, Megan Enan. Megan is a new music force of nature. Her performances thrive on elaborate sound worlds and fully developed dramatic interpretations. Passionate about contemporary chamber music and opera, Megan has worked with individuals and ensembles around the globe, including the International Contemporary Ensemble, Fifth House Ensemble, Great Noise Ensemble, Rhymes with Opera, and Synchromy. Megan is on a mission to change the world through the commissioning, performance, and proliferation of new music. She's deeply committed to the belief that new music should be performed and loved in communities of all size. And her advocacy for music and musicians extends beyond the performance stage. She also affects change as a nonprofit arts coach and consultant. You've likely interacted with her work for Neef North, Live Music Project, New Music USA, and many individual artists throughout classical and new music. Megan's work at the intersection of performance, creative placemaking, audience development, and music entrepreneurship is a delight and relief to her clients and colleagues. We had so much fun talking and we covered great topics for you, including how her voice teacher handed her a permission slip that profoundly impacted her path, her mission to empower artists and composers and to grow the voice repertoire, her advice on how to learn music, and even her practice plan, which you can download, and so much more. I'm telling you, there's much inspiration ahead. Let's go to the show. Megan Enan, it's so great to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you, Renee. I'm so excited to be here. Megan, you're a person of many talents. You're involved in the musical world in a variety of ways. You perform, you support composers and musicians and organizations, and you describe yourself as a mezzo-soprano on a mission to change the world through the commissioning, performance, and proliferation of new music. That's yes. so amazing to <laughs> see all the incredible things you're doing. So please tell us how all of this came about and how your artistic path has unfolded. Oh, sure. Well, I, let's see here. I'm from the Midwest originally, grew up in Iowa and in a musical and dramatic family. So we definitely had, you know, music lessons. I, I played viola. I took piano lessons. I sang, you know, and all of that. And uh, I love to tell this story that in high school, I was taking voice lessons, loved my voice teacher and was talking to her about what I was going to do in college. And, and I said, oh yeah, well, you know, my dream at the time was I'm going to be a high school choir director, right? Because that's what I knew and that's what I loved. And she, she said to me, Megan, have you ever thought about performing? And with all of the drama of like a high school or, you know, hand against forehead, I'm, I'm like, I don't know, Renee, do you think I could? Her name was also Renee. <laughs> and, uh, And she she kind of looks back and she's like, I think you'd be okay. <laughs> she's like just so solemn about it. And and that was it. You know, so I I always love to tell that story like off the bat because I think of I think of my voice teacher Renee as being one of my first big permission slips to do music, you know, to do music the way that I wanted to do music. And and along that, along my path, I I've just been so lucky and grateful to run into people who just kind of showed up with that next permission slip for me at the at the time when I really needed it and and so I went to went to undergrad in South Dakota and I did my master's at Peabody out in Baltimore and really there was when I started to get more and more involved with new music and during my master's I really still thought I was going to do this kind of traditional opera path and I got I was studying with Phyllis Brynjolfsson, who's an amazing, you know, vocalist as kind of a trailblazer in contemporary music for the voice. And we just like, aligned in so many of our passions and values. And, and I got just, I don't know, 
more and more passionate about contemporary classical music for the voice, wanted to work with more composers. Once I left my master's degree, I was really doing a lot of that working, gigging in Baltimore, D.C. And once I had moved away in about 2014, that was when every, you know, people that called me for gigs were calling me for new music things. You know, they they said, oh, we should call Megan for this. And so while I still sing a lot of things, I sing traditional, I sing early music and things like that. But people know me for this particular area of music, which is singing contemporary classical music and working with composers and being in new music. And I, I love it. I love, I love bringing the music of living composers to life and being in that collaborative process. So I just am very lucky that I kind of found that little corner of our musical universe. (laughs) I love that. First of all, I should have known you were a violist because you are so cool. That makes sense. That explains everything. <laughs> That's like, I'm all about that alto, alto clef life, like mezzo soprano, violist, like everything was like, Mm-mm. you get too high on the staff and I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I love it. I, I love what you said too about this permission slip that you were given. And I think that's so amazing because we so often see the opposite of people whose dreams are completely shut down by the gatekeepers. And, you know, I kind of want to take this as an opportunity to tell those people that, you know, gatekeepers don't really exist. So we can all start giving ourselves permission slips, but I love this expression. Oh yeah. I use this uh, part of my life as, you know, coaching and consulting and I use this concept with my with my clients all the time where I'm like, here's here's the permission slip. Like you can do this and you might be the only one who's saying that you can't. Yeah. So I try to check in with that myself whenever I'm feeling like I'm kind of up against something or maybe I'm on the quote unquote outside of something that I really want to be in. And I go, is someone keeping me out of this or am I keeping myself out of this? What does that look like to become more involved Mm. and do I need to just go talk to somebody or, you know, how, how is it possible to get involved? Not they're keeping me out. (laughs) And and to be, to be clear, you know, we work in a, in a field that has had a lot of gatekeeping issues in the past. And, and I try to see that more humanly now where I try to see if someone is bringing that kind of energy to me, what are they afraid of losing? What do they think they're going to lose in this situation that they have to work so hard to protect or hold on to and help them realize that, you know, we have the same goals or we want those similar things? Yeah, I love this. This is really great. And I want to talk about your work as a coach coming up, but I want to go back to the work that you do to commission new works because you're very proactive. It's not just like these pieces fall in your email (laughs) inbox. You are really energetically working towards having composers create. I love that. Please tell us about this a little bit more. Sure, sure. I feel hmm, I feel very lucky. I reached a milestone for myself recently, which is I've had over a hundred pieces written for me as a as a performer. And and that feels just so cool that that I've had to and a lot of these are you know composers that have written for me multiple times. So it's not all different composers, but it's a lot of people, you know, that I've gotten to work with in this way, which helps you really get into that process. <laughs> you know, you really know what that looks like after a while. And there are just so many composers that that are curious about writing for the voice and they want to write for the ensembles that I'm in. And it's great to work together. So sometimes that starts out as a relation. Oftentimes that's already a relationship where we know each other or know each other's work and say, oh yeah, I really, I really vibe with whatever they're doing musically. And I want to, I want to explore that more together or vice versa. They come to me and they say, I really like what you do on stage. And I'd like to write for, for that. And I go, great, (laughs) like let's do that. And, and the commissioning process can feel daunting sometimes to people who are, are new to it, but it doesn't have to be because it's really about it's really about saying, okay, well, we both have goals for this process. Let's make sure that we get those on the table early. Hmm. That can look like a contract, right? Where you say like, 
okay, well, I commit to doing this side and you commit to doing these things. And this is the timetable that we're going to use. And here are the resources involved. It's basically what you're saying with a contract. And then you move forward. And the more of those expectations that you get out on the table and talk about clearly early in the process, the better your collaboration is going to be, right? So, so I love that part. And working with composers often allows me to say, like, what are you influenced by? What do you like to hear? And then tell me about your sound, what I always call your sound goals, right? Mm -hmm. What are your sound goals? What's your sound world? And then let's work together to achieve that. And I'll tell you, you know, how my instrument likes to do that, how my mm -hmm. voice likes to do that. And, and we can kind of come up with like, what's the best version of that for this, for this idea. Mm, I love that. That's really the embodiment of collaboration. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, it's so great. One of the things that I really love is as a singer, I get to work with text and that's, you know, really important to me <laughs> and working with composers who are alive is really wonderful in like this really nuanced little area where I can ask them to make me a voice recording, a voice memo of them just simply reading the text. And I promise you nine times out of 10, it opens all these doors to little uh, subtle changes that I would go, Oh, that don't quite make it into the score, but I kind of wish that mm. those record, I think of those recordings as being part of the score. It's like, it's a, it's a sound score rather than the printed score. And, you know, you have this kind of oral tradition idea where they, they are reading it to themselves and you can kind of hear where their cadence goes, where they, where their pacing goes. And, and so it tells you, especially if they feel like there's this slight stress on a word. And then when you can bring that out in how you perform the piece, it's so magical. And so those little bits of collaboration, I think are, yeah, what keep, what definitely keeps me in it, keeps me wanting to do more and more of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so extraordinary. That brings me to something I'm really curious about because I'm someone who's extremely nerdy about wanting to know more about <laughs> practicing. And I'm curious about how that process looks like for a singer, because it's very different than the yeah. way a violinist might go about it. Yeah. We don't have text, first yeah. of all. And that was such a great story, by the way. I love that you you get them to read the text to you. And that's awesome. So what does that look like for you when you learn a piece and you take it from, you know, the first glance to the stage? Oh, yeah. I think having a background in both vocal and instrumental music is really helpful, I think, in this. And mm -hmm. approaching a piece. So I taught for for quite a few years at the, you know, I taught a high school level students and collegiate level courses and studio and stuff like that. And so really getting to work with students from the very beginning is important to me. And so I actually put together like a practice plan. I'm happy to share it if you want to share it with part <laughs> of this episode, like, because it's, it is something that I thought about, put into practice. And I know that you and I vibe on this, Renee, which is being very efficient with your time in the studio or in the practice room. So I put it down and I try to be very focused on my practice time because I have a lot of repertoire usually that I'm trying to get to the highest level possible and moving through it with a plan of action and steps and being mm. efficient is necessary. It's not just like a nice to have, it's a, it's a necessary <laughs> element. So, so having this, I usually start with things like with solfege. I'm a big solfege person. So any sort of, any sort of system for pitches and intervals, I think where, because I don't have perfect pitch. So I need to map that out in my, in my brain and my ears. And so any sort of system that you like, if it's number, if it's numbers, letter names, solfege, whatever works for you works for me. And I tend to do solfege for all my pieces. I do a lot of clapping and counting. I do like count singing. I, so I kind of move through all of these things. Then I do things, you know, vowels only just doing or like one vowel and then doing just the vowels, right? Because as singers and kind of like the bow, right? Our bow is like, we're on the air, we're on the vowel. And if I keep these vowels connected and, and really, 
um, smooth and clear, then the consonants can also be very clear. It's We think about diction a lot as singers. And so when I'm thinking about this, people think that diction is like this aggressive use of consonants, but it's really mm-hmm. about it's really about having the clearest vowels possible and then making sure that the consonants are like these little bows that you tie mm. on to the length of the phrase. And That's fascinating. yeah, and so I think about that a lot, but also you'd feel the same way with like drawing the bow is if the bow is unclear, it doesn't matter how fast, you know, the left hand's moving or whatever yeah. fancy things it's doing. If the bow is being all over the place, <laughs> then yeah. Not going to happen, right? (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) So I do a lot of that thinking about, you know, kind of chunking down phrases, building them up. And then also that moves into the kind of who am I on stage, even if it's something that doesn't have text or it's not, it's not a theater piece necessarily, but what is the story that I'm trying to tell? What space am I inviting a listener into? And what is that like? So I, I really love the act of performance and, and chamber music performance, solo performance, that kind of thing, because I really think that you're inviting an audience or a listener into a space that you're creating. Mm. And the more that you think through what that experience is going to be like, the more impactful and powerful it can be musical experience for the listener. And, and I just think that that's such a such a gift that we give to each other, right? To, to be in that space together. And that's what I, you know, thinking about that. I, that's the stuff that I missed the most during the time where we didn't perform during pandemic as much is being in the room, creating that environment to think through these thoughts, feelings, ideas kind of together communally, you know, we're all mm-hmm. showing up for that. Yeah. Yeah. This is so fascinating. I love it. And I love that you're talking about mapping things out with the intervals and uh, that because you don't have the absolute pitch, you figured out ways to solidify all of these intervals because so many people would use not having perfect pitch as an excuse to stay away from this repertoire. Mm -hmm. But it really looks like you have spent a great deal of time figuring out processes. Um, You're using a lot of problem solving methods and you have this framework that you use to get that piece from start to finish. And that is just so wonderful because it shows how anyone who figures out how to use all the practice tools in the way that works for themselves could potentially tackle any repertoire that they want. Absolutely. I think May I tell one one quick story? You can tell a long story. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. So, so my, my voice teacher for my master's, Phyllis, who I'd mentioned before, I love to tell this story because she, this is a permission slip story, is there was one day, and she had these big cabinets full of repertoire, you know, full of like scores. And she'd open up this cabinet, she'd grab something, pull it out, and she'd go, okay, let's just sight read this. Also, Phyllis definitely had perfect pitch and and was like, oh, you can do it. It's totally fine. And I, so she'd pull out this score. And I remember her pulling out an R. Murray Schaefer score once that was that was all a uh, uh, graphic notation and it opens it up and she, and she goes, yeah, let's just get into it. You know, <laughs> I was like, and I go, Phyllis, I don't even know how to read this. And she goes, Oh, it's fine. We'll just figure it out. You know? And she had, you know, this, she was also from North Dakota. So we had this very Midwestern quality in our, <laughs> she goes, Oh, it's fine. We just figure it out. And I, I remember that every time I approach something, there are scores that I get every day that have new things in them that that composers are saying, hey, can we try out this idea? Maybe it's different notation. Maybe it's a different sound. Maybe it's a mixture of things that they heard and they want to hear again. And every day I'm looking at a score and I go, I don't even know if I know how to do this. And I hear Phyllis's voice in my mm. head go, oh, we just figure it out. And so whenever I'm talking about preparing new music pieces or really anything is I just want people to hear that same permission slip, which is as a musician, you're never required to already know you're required to say, 
I can figure it out and approach that in the studio so that you don't get um, kind of demoralized by new things. You get excited by new things and you go, well, I don't know about this yet. I'm about to figure it out (laughs) and like seeing something. And that always means that you can ask somebody, you can reach out, you could reach out to somebody and say, I've never counted this rhythm before. Can you, can you give me some insight into this? Or I've never looked at this notation before. Have you seen something like this and give me some pointers? There's always like somebody you could reach out to, or maybe there's a recording, or if the composer's living, there's not a recording, but you can ask the composer, you can say, I'm thinking about doing something like this. Do you like that direction? (laughs) And that's, there's a freedom there that I, that I don't know if people always feel when they think about new music or they are attempting to study new music scores in their in their studio or with their with their teacher with their students and they they feel like it needs to be very rigid and there are some scores that really want that incredible precision and that's great like see if you can figure that out can I figure out this incredible precision there are other scores that are the exact opposite that are just here's a couple of lines of text and you're going to make a 20 minute piece out of this just and then you go, okay. <laughs> like, and it it requires that uh, commitment to, you know, everything is figure outable um, rather than rather than, oh, this is scary and unfamiliar and new, and I should leave this for somebody else. Somebody else is somebody else already knows how to do this, so I shouldn't I shouldn't try. That's so powerful what you just shared. And I know that someone listening to this needed to hear that. And, you know, I'll say if that was you, reach out to me and Megan and let us know. And like how (laughs) you gave yourself permission today to just figure it out. You should you should have like a hotline where people can call like (laughs) 1-800 and all you say is just figure it out. (laughs) Yeah. I'll be like, here's your permission slip. Figure it out. (laughs) Thanks so much for sharing this. I think it was, you know, it's the essence of everything. So many creative minds out there are still kind of, I mean, it sounds a little bit dramatic, but wearing the shackles of Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trying to do things a specific way or believing the labels that were put on them by other people and just... Mm -hmm this idea of I can go in any direction that I want and I can figure it out. I think one of the ideas that you, you just helped me kind of find was one of the real other permission slips that Phyllis gave me was that I don't have to spend the rest of my career trying to appease or get two gold stars from my, from my teacher because the thing that she wants me to do the most is go figure it out, mm. right? Go go figure out who you're going to be as an artist. Go figure out what music you're going to make. And and even if you work in in the most traditional of classical music styles, that you don't need to keep trying to win the affection of your teachers. They want you to go figure it out. And that doesn't mean that you have to go work solely in new music or anything like that. It means find who you are in this music, find who you are in this orchestra, in this ensemble, whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good segue into something else I wanted to discuss uh, with with you is the fact that you're multi-passionate, multi-gifted, I might say. And as I said at the beginning, you work in several capacities, supporting organizations, supporting artists. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because you have so many awesome things out there. You have the Sybaritic Singer, you have your Friday series, which is so great. Um, You lead organizations. Tell us more about this work that you do. You also mentioned working with clients. So, Yeah. Well, and so I, I tend to think of my, my professional life in kind of three spheres or three pieces of pie in the pie chart, right? And so performing is one of those pieces, coaching and consulting is is one of them. And then the the third one is that I am the executive director of 
the Live Music Project, which is an organization that it's an advocacy organization for kind of the field of classical music. One of our main programs is that we have this concert calendar that you can use to filter concerts by your interest. So you can look by composer, you can look by instrument, you can look by all sorts of things, which recently went national. So I'm very excited about the growth of this organization. So anybody listening to this podcast, I really, really hope that they'll put their concerts or, you know, tell the marketing director of your orchestra or whatever to put your concerts on the calendar because it's such a great tool for one of the things that I am passionate about, which is audience development, Mm. which is connecting live music experiences with listeners who want to hear them. You know, people want to hear what you're making and, and making it easy by using the gifts of technology, making it easy for them to find it, to go, to buy tickets, all of that stuff to, to engage with it is, is deeply important to me. So So my work with Live Music Project is one of those facets where I go, okay, well, I really care about this field. I care about connecting hardworking musicians with eager listeners. Where can I make the most impact? And right now that's with Live Music Project getting to do this work. We have um, our eighth birthday party is coming up in in May. So if, you know, so I hope people will just kind of keep an eye out for Live Music Project in general and sign up for our email lists and stuff like that. So that part's really important to me. And then the my coaching and consulting side is an outgrowth. I started a blog called The Sybaritic Singer. And, you know, <laughs> started a blog in, in 20, oh, 2009, something like that, 2010, something around there. And kept it going. And I really just wanted to write about, re- do reviews of things that I was seeing and also writing about my experience. And I started a really popular series called 29 days to diva which you can imagine was a, a leap year it started in february <laughs> like you know so every year i would write this series which is like a kind of a a micro action every day of that month that just kind of helped you feel like oh this is something really manageable that i can do right now that's going to help me feel like i'm moving my career forward mm-hmm. and and that turned into you know lots of things and a, a lot of my so coaching happened because you know people would reach out to me and say like hey I have a question about this and and then once that happens enough times you start going like well here are my coaching packages yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're like I'm gonna you know I will make this a professional service now I will make this an offer and and that's been really great I love working with my clients and I work you know with with performers composers you know educators kind of creative types in general, because a lot of what I do happens to be on the business entrepreneurship side of, of coaching and consulting, kind of helping people figure out their particular businesses. We're all living this kind of super freelance life. And when people feel like, I don't really know how to, you know, turn this into a a business that's when we talk you know we like come come on over we'll chat about it and and so that's that is part of where you know I I have a podcast and I also have this Friday series that you mentioned these little like weekly videos that I do as Facebook lives but you can see them on you know Instagram and YouTube and stuff where I just kind of do the same thing we just talk about these little bite-sized things it's easy to to digest it hopefully has to do with like both the mindset side of what we do and the kind of nuts and bolts side of like running your actual professionally creative life yeah this is so great and those people <laughs> reaching out for help it really shows your brilliance and for those people who don't know you i can attest to your brilliance i see it in <laughs> action all the time and i really love how uh, an expression I like to use is you follow the breadcrumbs. Yes, yes, I love that. How you <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah, you, you go with things that are calling to you and you just, you know, walk yeah. in that direction and that takes you somewhere wonderful for our benefit. Yeah. I think we've talked about this phrase before, which is, you know, be tenacious about the goals, but be flexible about the methods, mm. I think is is that kind of so I I really love having big goals and writing them out and kind of breaking them down, but 
but following the breadcrumbs is the thing that's always gotten me closer to those goals rather than being rigid about what I think the path should look like. <laughs> and I, so following the breadcrumbs is, is absolutely a core value of mine. <laughs> yeah. And I really hope that the listeners will consult all of these resources that I've mentioned uh, in your podcast. Um, it's called the Masterclass series, is it? Yeah, it's called Studio Class. Exactly. Studio class. Yes. <laughs> it's so great. I love I just love everything you do. And um the Friday sessions are so helpful and inspiring. And it's exactly because of what you said, yeah. because it's just these totally applicable uh tidbits of advice that are so relevant to what we do. It's really great. I'm gonna Thank put you. links in the that show means notes. A lot to me. <laughs> yes. Yay. <laughs> Megan, I could speak with you all day, but how about a, a round of rapid fire question before I let you go? Oh, I'm so ready. So ready for this rapid fire. <laughs> What's a habit that you have that you think contributed to your success? Definitely goal setting. I, I think the, the, I, sorry, this is not the rapid fire part. I, mean, <laughs> the, I have this thing that I call the, the 20 year goal exercise that really helped me out of like a darker period of burnout. And I, I don't think I would have come back to m music. I don't think I would have been able to like stay in it without something like that. So, so I know the ups and downs of this as well. And something like having that, what I call the 20 year goal exercise, you're thinking like way out in the future. What is it that I want to do? Let's break those goals down. Mm. was really helpful. So that's a that's a tool that's really helped me. Oh, I love that. Yes. And we can actually call this a slow burning fire question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the em the embers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'd love to know if there's a performance that has stayed with you throughout the years and why. I know that you've premiered so many works. So it must be incredibly difficult to to choose among any of performances that you've done or maybe performances that you've been yeah. to, but I'd be really curious. Oh, that, yeah, you're right. There's It's so hard for us to choose, but I think that we all have those moments. And I think I'll stick with the, my theme of these permission slips mm -hmm. maybe. And I did a performance, this is maybe 2012, where I was a fellow at the Bang on a Can Festival, and I got to sing Ancient Voices of Children, the George Crumb work. And I remember performing it and almost having this kind of like moment where I drifted like away from myself. You know, it's like you're almost seeing yourself performing. And I had this moment of thinking about getting to that place and what it meant and that that, that was And I kind of felt like, oh, this is what it's always like, is that you're always working towards this. And that's the overall feeling. And I'm not explaining it very well, but I just had this, this moment of being like, oh, I can do this. And this is what my life is like. This is my life. And, and being able to say, like, this is what it'll be going forward. And having such a deep connection to George Crumb's music in particular, just feeling like really strongly about that. And I had a, a member of the audience come up to me afterwards that said that he was part of the original George Crumb like ensemble. Yeah. And he said, you did very fine work, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and I was like, oh, thank you. You know, like I'm getting misty eyed and I was like, thank, thank you so much. So those, so yes, it's an, it's that internal external thing. When you, when you're having your own internal moment, mm of saying, oh, it's like I figured something out. And then also someone else says like, you're doing it. You're actually doing it. You know, those moments when they go hand in hand, you're like, that's a very powerful yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Powerful is the word for sure. Do you have a favorite tool in the practice room? Oh, a metronome, mm -hmm. hands down. Yes. <laughs> like, I think I use, I use, Two, two apps, like I use a tuner app. I think it's called ClearTune. ClearTune and I use my my metronomics app constantly. So especially for things like doing nested rhythms and stuff like that, having a, having a metronome that can also help you understand the smaller subdivisions of something. I was like, mm, that's, that's the ticket. Mm. And I'm smiling a little bit because during the Joyful Practice Challenge, 
Ralph Schiano's tip was about using technology. And one of the apps that he recommended was the Super Metronome, which was yes. super fun. I don't know if you've heard about it, but if you yeah. <laughs> ever want to, you know, jam some Beethoven to a Latin rhythm, this yes. would be the app for you. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I love the permission slip idea. I think I'm going to have a post it nearby put it in my little mirror here and look at it all the time. Is there any other piece of advice that was given to you that you'd like to pass on to the listeners? Mm, I think my, my favorite piece of advice early on was show up, move chairs. And, <laughs> and I have to say that that has actually been one of the superpowers over my career is the number of times that I showed up and stayed and moved chairs turned into more gigs than I can tell you about. <laughs> like, wow. So okay. it's, and so it, yes, it's, but it is, it's a, yes, it's about helping, but it's also about saying we value the same things and I know how hard you're working and I'm here to help. Mm. Right. And you chat about things during those moments too, where you say like, Oh, I trust this person a little bit more, you know? And then they say, Oh, well, let me, they remember that and they go, maybe Megan's available for this gig. Let me just reach out and see. And maybe Megan would like to, you know, be on our board or something like that. Move chairs. You're definitely getting a board invitation. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, but I, I do really mean that is like, um, the moving chairs can be metaphorical is show up and, and show that you're willing to help because you're recognizing how much work people are putting into something that, Obviously, if you're in a space where you can't move chairs because of union rules or something, <laughs> you can you can pick another way to quote unquote move chairs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a great advice. I love it. That's <laughs> another post-it from my mirror right there. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, how about a quick actionable tip that the listeners could implement today in their musical lives in addition to listen to every single one of your Friday sessions? <laughs> That's very nice of you. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Okay. M my actionable tip is, is plan ahead for the hard feelings, mm. plan ahead for the moments that, what will you do when you feel professional jealousy? What will you do when you're feeling worried about money? What will you feel when you're, what will you do when you're feeling burnt out on, you know, auditioning or performing or whatever, think ahead right now. If you're feeling really great about what you're doing, if you're feeling really great about money, if you're feeling really great about auditions, if you're feeling really great about whatever, then take that moment and say like, what would I do? What would I tell somebody who was struggling with this right now? And honest to God, like write it out, put it in a Google doc. I don't care. Like put it in your, like in case of emergency vault. <laughs> like, and then And maybe that's just collecting nice things that people have said about you so that when you're feeling like, should I keep doing this? You go back and you go, oh, yeah, look at all these people that sent me a nice a nice email once, you know, or I got this great review, whatever it is. But plan ahead because everybody has those moments and we don't necessarily broadcast them as much as, as some of the other things, you know, so there's no thrilled to announce I'm going through, you know, going through like burnout yeah. at the moment. Um, but it's okay to think through that and say like, okay, well, what would I tell somebody that was going through that when I'm not? And then give that to yourself for those moments that it will inevitably show up in your life. And, and it's okay. It doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. It just means that This is how we navigate those waters. Mm. This is great. My mic's on the stand. Otherwise, I would drop it. <laughs> <laughs> you were so funny. <laughs> no, but this is this is very powerful. I don't think the, the listeners could see it, but I was closing my eyes as you started talking because I was taking it all in. Really, really powerful. Thank you so much, Renee. <laughs> Megan, where can everyone find all of the goodness about you? <laughs> I love this. Well, so my website is meganenan.com. It's I-H-N-E-N. 
And there you can kind of find everything and find me on all the socials at at Mezzo Enan, M-E-Z-Z-O-I-H-N-E-N. That's fantastic. I'm going to put links in the show notes. And also, please tell us about any fun projects that are upcoming that we should check Ooh, for. Yeah. Let's see here. I have two albums coming out this summer, so I hope that people will kind of keep an eye out for those. One of them is with Parma label, and it's a cool a, a cool project where they do a call for scores. So I got to work with a lot of new composers for this one and worked with some of my favorite collaborators. And and so that's very cool. And then I also have the second in a three album project of wordless lullabies for the voice. And that'll be coming out in August. So Parma in July and uh, and Sleep Songs number two in August. So I'm excited about those. Oh, this is great. And please make sure that I know about it so I can share about it when it <laughs> yes, comes out. Yes, I will. Thank you. <laughs> Megan, as the listeners probably feel now, you are such an incredible person. You have this amazing energy about you. And you're just so wonderful on oh every level. <laughs> Your story is going to have many of us inspired to give ourselves that permission slip. I'm sure I know it, in fact. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, it's such a pleasure. You know, I always, we could talk about all this stuff for days. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with mezzo-soprano coach and entrepreneur Megan Enan. Don't forget to share today's episode with everyone you think might benefit from Megan's insight. Share a post on Instagram or Facebook and tag us so we can say hi and keep the conversation going. I'm mind over finger everywhere and she's mezzo Enan or Megan Enan. Of course, I'll have those links and all the links where you can check out Megan's work in the show notes, and you can find those in your podcast app or at mindoverfinger.com. While there, don't forget to check out the Music Mastery Experience and book your free call today so we can start planning extraordinary things for you. So that's what I have today. Be well, my friend. Once again, Thank you so much for listening and à bientôt.